we have four simple rules. Number one, we don't discuss politics, ever. Number two, this is not a religious channel, and while you might hear people say, God bless you, or I'm going to pray for you, or I wouldn't have gotten through this without my faith, that's fine. What's not fine is to say, my God is better than your God, or here's why you're not getting into heaven. It's not going to fly. Number three, we believe wholeheartedly if you can't control your tongue, then you can't control your life. So while on board, there's not going to be any cursing in the live chat, period. And number four, there is no room for mean people on the lifeboat. Because we discuss very sensitive things from people's past in our group setting, we got to protect those people. The only way they feel confident and comfortable discussing those things is in an environment that is free of trolls and mean people. So if you're a mean person or you're a troll, we're going to block you for life. And if your account happens to be less than 24 hours old, we're probably a little suspicious right from the word go. Why? Well, because there are people in this world who enjoy being cruel solely for the sake of being cruel. It's not going to fly here. But if you're here because you're trying to get sober and live your best life, then you might find that the lifeboat is just that, a lifeboat. I'm Captain Tommy Scoville, and we will see you on deck. Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm Captain Tommy Scoville, and you're on the lifeboat. Glad you're all here. I really am. You know, the uh, the more we do this, uh, the more I really get to a point where uh, I start caring for uh, for people. And that being said, people, um, if you ever see somebody in the comment section and they're saying something that's frightening, please reach out to those people. You know, I read a couple of comments that scared the crap out of me. And it's just people that seem like they're really not in a great place. Um, you know, I, I try checking these things as often as I possibly can. If you come across someone that's left a comment that sounds frightening to you, reach out to me. Reach out to my bobbleheaded partner. Try to get one of us uh, on the horn so that, uh, you know, we can try to do, you know, something. Um, you know, intervene at some level or whatever the case may be, you know, but um, so tonight, people, we're going to be talking about communication. And I kind of think of this as the um, part three in a three part series. The first one we talked about, you know, you could talk to me or you could talk to anybody else here at the lifeboat. And we talked about opening up uh, when you start feeling that things are squirrely, when you start feeling like you're not in a great place. Good to see you, Mr. Hunt. Uh, when you feel like you're not in a good place, that's the time to make the call. That's the time to reach out, right? Because as we've said so many times, if you let it fester, bad things happen, right? Um, so it's really important that you reach out. The second thing that we talked about was yesterday was um, listening, right? Becoming a little bit better at actually listening to what people say, as opposed to just hearing what people say. Taking the time to really listen, to try to understand and put yourself in that person's shoes, and it's an absolute essential part of this entire uh, rehab thing. It really is. You know, it's the, the backbone of everything that we do in recovery hinges on communication. And communication skills are essential if you plan on getting and staying sober. There are no two ways around it. So today, I kind of want to do a uh, sort of a wrap up of everything that we've been talking about. And I've got some stuff that, hey, Lady Fiona Crispin, good to see you. Um, there are a couple of things that have happened that um, sort of hammered this stuff home. And I want to talk about it. And, you know, the uh, if by some chance I'm talking about you, uh, just know that I'm not using your name, so you got nothing to worry about. But uh, as I said yesterday, we're communicating a lot more with people from the lifeboat, right? A lot of people are reaching out to us and there's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of give and take with, um, you know, the people that are trying to get sober and that's the dream. That's what we want. We're happy as hell about that. 
no question. Um, and uh, for the most part, everybody's really good at it. But I want to give you a perfect example of why I think it is so important that we jump on these things exactly when they happen. I got an email from someone that said, I've been feeling really messed up since uh, Sunday. And, um, or maybe it was Saturday. I've been feeling really, yeah, it was Saturday. I've been feeling messed up since Saturday. And uh, I, I drafted you a letter, but I didn't send it to you because, you know, I really didn't want to bother you. And, uh, you know, I, I know you got a lot going on. And then I, I was going to reach out to you yesterday. People, you know what happened, right? I don't have to like, this is not going to come as a shock to anybody. But from that day that he felt something wasn't right until today, when the two of us got on the phone together, um, this individual found himself in a tailspin an absolute tailspin. And this is not unique to this individual. This is everybody. This is something that happens to each and every one of us. And I've been guilty of it. I assure you I have. But uh, the longer that I stay sober and the more that uh, time that I spend on the lifeboat, the more I take this really like as serious as you could possibly imagine. When you start feeling some kind of way, I don't care what that way is. You start feeling a little bit too depressed. You start feeling a little bit too happy. You start feeling a little bit too anything. If you feel out of sorts, bad things are happening. And this should be really obvious, but we're going to go over it again because you know what? Sometimes, um, sometimes stuff that feels like it ought to be obvious sometimes isn't. And that's not anybody's fault. It's just because we have a difficult time getting out of our own way, right? So let's talk about... Um, about recovery in general, right? We have said this a thousand times. I'm going to say it a thousand more because it really is uh, so important to what we have going on. Our ability to cope is diminished. All of us on the lifeboat, our coping mechanisms for a very long period of time were purchased illicitly or at a liquor store. Our coping skills came in little Ziploc baggies or bottles. We didn't feel like we had the ability to cope with whatever was going on in our lives. So we drugged ourselves, right? This is not coming as a shock, I would assume to anybody. So what happens is we get sober, we get chemical free, we, we remove the, uh, the chemical from our life, and then really funny stuff starts happening, right? Emotions start to encroach on us. And you know, we, we tend to think about um, when bad things happen, right? When bad things happen, it's really obvious. You start feeling like, boy, I'm having a hard time dealing with this. How about when great things happen? You have to understand that over the course of the time that you have been using, you didn't learn any coping skills. When things were too good, we got high. When things were too bad, we got high. When things were at a baseline, we got high. Every single day, our coping mechanism was to get ripped. Now we find ourselves in the real world and a lot of really funky stuff happens. I'm going to use me as an example. If you've been on the lifeboat a while, you remember when I went to Florida, right? I had a vacation down there and I broadcasted from uh, my uncle's place. Beautiful property. Um, absolutely gorgeous right out there on the water. And I, uh, I also filmed in the room that I had been staying in. It kind of had that... Uh, the door that was rounded at the top. If, um, the reason I'm mentioning that is if you haven't seen it before, it shouldn't be hard to find, right? You can go back and, and see that I am uh, broadcasting from a different place. I had not seen my aunt and uncle in about three decades, which is no coincidence that that's about the amount of time I spent addicted to heroin. I was not trying to run into um, my aunt and uncle, both of whom are very accomplished um, surgeons who know an awful lot about drugs and an awful lot about the human body. I avoided them like the plague because there was no chance in hell. They weren't going to look at me and go, wow, what happened to your pupils? Right. I may have been able to slide this by normal people. There was no chance I was going to be able to slide it by my aunt and uncle um, who are not just doctors. They're fairly hip and they've been through, you know, a lot in life and definitely would have called me on it. So I went down and I had this vacation and I had a chance to meet cousins that truthfully I've never met. I've seen them grow up in pictures, but 
So I'm running into my um, two cousins for the first time. There's three of them. One is a doctor and was um, in a different part of the country. But I run into these two and they're, they're adults. They're absolutely adults. The last time I saw either of them, they were this big. I'm not kidding you. They're about the size of squirrel. And I hung out with them. We went out, worked out a little bit. I had a great opportunity to talk to my uh, aunt at length. And she and I have always been Prior to me disappearing, we've been very close. We talked on the phone, but so anyway, when I had left from that vacation and I came home, I got body slammed with the this postpartum kind of a thing from the vacation. All of a sudden, I was back home. I was sitting in my office. I was looking at the camera and I was filming the lifeboat. But all of the emotions that I went through in Florida, I didn't do anything with. Nothing, right? The reunion, talking about the loss of my grandparents, which I had never done with these um, relatives of mine because they hadn't seen me since that happened. Talking about the death of my father. There was, you know, a couple of nights where everybody sat around and just told stories about my dad. And I went through all these things. But as a sober individual, a newly sober individual, less than a decade, I sat there and everything just sort of went around around me. And instead of dealing with those issues as they were coming up, well, I was on vacation, right? So you're in a different surroundings. All of those things were going on, but I wasn't actually focusing on any one of these things. And when I came back home, all of them body slammed me. Now, I wasn't smart enough to realize that was what was happening. I just knew that all of a sudden, for absolutely no apparent reason, I was depressed. And I mean, big time depressed. I remember talking to my bobbleheaded partner. I talked to some other people and it was just, I couldn't get out of my own way. I didn't know why. Today, I got to have that discussion with somebody who's going through the exact same thing. And I said to them, hey, you know what? While you were on vacation, I'll bet you that you went through a whole host of things that you didn't deal with. I've talked about this, but it's been a long time since I have. There are a lot of people that are of the firm belief that we should be a direct streaming service as human beings, right? So something comes into us, we have an emotion, that emotion could be uh, jealousy, it could be fear, it could be happiness, it could be anything, right? It comes in and in theory, you go like this, you grab it, you look at it and you toss it, right? Happiness comes in, oh, cool, you grab it, you look at it, you toss it, right? And this kind of thing is supposed to be happening constantly. So you're like a streaming service. And all of the things that are going on in your life are just streaming by. You're not holding on to any of them, good, bad, indifferent. When we hold on to them like a, a VCR, right? Like a recording device, as opposed to a streaming service, they start to wreak havoc in our, uh, in our system. And the reason for that is we never learned how, right? Even air quotes, normal people are not very good at this. When we get emotions that back up inside of us, then we go to our number one coping mechanism, right? No matter what that coping mechanism is, there are people that will go out and run. There are people that will work out. There are people that will watch TV. There are people that will go to their coping mechanism. Mine was heroin for three and a half decades. So if I let something come in here and I go like this, oh, look, anger. Oh, I think I'll hold on to this one for a minute. Not ready to get rid of this one. So I'm going to hold on to this. Well, it gets in there and it starts to fester and it starts to cause problems. And what would I normally do? Well, I would jab a needle in my arm. You know, you want to get over some, some anger, boy, heroin will knock that out. But instead, I'm not doing that. I'm sober. So what I do is I hold it for a little while. I play with it and then I let it go. But I don't let it go because I held on to it and it's there. And now it's in the back of my head and it's going. And the next emotion that comes through, I do the same thing, right? Now it's happiness, I'm excited, something's going on, whatever. I grab that, I look at it, I'm like, oh, this is cool. This was way better than the last one. I think I'm gonna hold on to this. Maybe I'll even hold on to it for a couple of days, right? Because this is happiness, this is good stuff. People were never supposed to obsess on any emotion. It's supposed to come in, be dealt with and get rid of it. And we don't do that. So when I got back from Florida, I had all of these emotions that I had been you know, grabbing, taking a good look at and shoving in the back of my head. You know, oh, it's great to see you guys again. Wow, this is kind of cool. I'll stick this back here, right? Um, then they brought up my dad. 
And I'm now coping with the loss of my father around relatives, which I didn't do. When my dad passed, I dealt with it on my own. So now here I am with other people and I look at it and I go, yeah, we'll put this one back here too, right? And all of these things that I coped with for a 10 day vacation, um, they got in the back of my head and just started raising hell, right? They were back there having a party and I wasn't prepared to cope with those, not even one at a friggin' time, much less six or seven or eight or whatever it is I had on the shelf. The moral of the story, people, is if I had my you-know-what together, the first night that we sat down there and we talked about my dad and started talking about, you know, what a great guy he was and his sense of humor and some of the stuff, I would have rung up my bobbleheaded partner afterwards and said, I just spent three hours talking about my dad and it's... Uh, and it's great, but it's still tearing my guts out. It was, it was fun to hear stories from him, but it made me think about the time that I spent locked up when I wasn't a part of his life. And when they told stories from times that I wasn't there, it brought on this guilt, you know, that I, I was definitely not making the end of his life very pleasant while I was incarcerated. You know, had I made that call then when I got home, I wouldn't have gone into the tailspin and the depression and all of the other crap. People, when you get out of whack, it doesn't have to be, you know, I'm trashing the house kind of messed up. It can be, I don't feel right, right? Something just doesn't feel right. You know how often we don't have the ability to articulate or even understand exactly why we don't feel right? When I got on the phone with this guy today who said to me, I've been I've been depressed since Saturday and I probably should have reached out in 15 minutes. We were off the phone and he said to me, I've been thinking about this stuff for five days, four days. Now it's over. Everything feels normal. I feel like my life is back together. I don't even know how to you know, explain this. And I said, well, I can explain it. I'm not encumbered by any of the emotions you're going through. So when you tell me what's going on, I can objectively sit back and go, yeah, I know, I know why you're going through this. It's this, this, and this. And I can even tell you maybe how you can fix it. All of those things that you were shoving on the back shelf and not dealing with, you're just going to have to deal with them one at a time. You're going to have to actually sit down and go, well, this is the emotion I was feeling from that. And this is why I'm feeling this emotion. And I said, and if you start feeling squirrely about it, pick up the damn phone and call me because I'm detached from this scene. There's a reason that counseling is a billion dollar industry right? It's because the person you're talking to has no vested interest in the emotional aspect of whatever it is you're going through. Now, if you got a hundred and a half an hour, you can go, you know, like lay back on a couch. They have usually have those little trickling waterfall things, which are cool to listen to, right? Little music, probably incense. They make those rooms ridiculously comfortable to be in. And they're going to stare at the clock and they're going to listen to you. And if you can pull them off in an hour, you're going to feel great when you walk out of there. Or, or you can reach out to someone who knows exactly what you're going through. Every single person on this boat can be that counselor. And you'll be astounded. Like Niall um, Parkinson said one day, it, it's almost crazy how great he is when the chips are down and no one seems to be able to figure anything out. You know, we've talked about this. Well, of course you are. You spent your whole damn life in crisis. The average person might have one a decade. As a, as a, a full-blown practicing drug addict, you have a crisis every eight minutes. Now, do you deal with them? No, but you get accustomed to living in one. So when other people are having crises, you're usually very calm and, and, and relaxed and can say, yeah, I think I know why you're going through this. But none of that is going to happen if you don't pick up the damn telephone right? Or sit down at the keyboard or do whatever it is you have to do to engage someone in the same boat, right? I really, really hope this is making sense to you because this is very often you'll hear me say, this is sobriety 101, right? Or this is nuts and bolts. This is the nuts and bolts stuff of staying sober. If you're going to allow yourself to start feel in all kinds of emotions that you might not be equipped to cope with just yet and think to yourself, I really don't want to share this with anybody yet. 
what you're really saying is, I'm going to put this on the shelf until it destroys the shelf, the wall behind it, and the room that it's in. And if I leave it there any longer, it's going to start to erode at the foundation of my sobriety, right? Those little rooms that are dark that we leave in the back of our mind, those are dangerous as hell, right? You don't just need to open up the door. You need to kick on a freaking searchlight. There needs to be no shadows. There needs to be nothing. You understand? All of the things that are bothering you need to come to light. And I mean, bright light. And the only way that that's going to happen is if you make that effort when you start feeling out of sorts. And I hear people all the time say, well, you know what? I'm really not comfortable um, having those kind of conversations with people. Are you comfortable being an addict? Are you comfortable drinking a fifth a day? doing four grams of smack a day, right? Snorting an eight ball a day. Are those things comfortable to you? Because I'm going to tell you something right now, and this is absolutely a fact. You're going to get comfortable talking about the things that are going on in your life, or you're going to stay comfortable being a drug addict. Honestly, if you figure out a way to do this without ever sharing anything from your life, well, then please come to me and we'll write a book because it's not done, right? This is not me and my bobble-headed partner coming up with this. These are smarter minds than the two of us, I assure you. But it's the gold standard for a damned reason. And that reason is it works. And it is the only thing that does. Before I go, even a step further, I just saw Chi-Chi on the deck of the boat. Chi-Chi, it is so good to see you back on the lifeboat. Wow. People, if you're new to the lifeboat... Um, yeah. She is uh, OG. She's OG life founding boat. crew member here on the lifeboat who has had some uh, issues with uh, internet and such and has been sort of um, she's been catching up during the days on some of the older stuff. But it's been a while since we have seen Chi Chi on deck. And uh, if you go back far enough, you'll hear us say things like we need a little more Chi Chi on this boat or <laughs> the default setting on the uh, lifeboat should be Chi Chi. Um, so I can't tell you the, uh, the honor to, uh, look out on the deck and see her. Mm -hmm. Welcome home, Chi Chi. We're glad that you're here. Exactly. Exactly. A lot of, um, a lot of new people in here too tonight, Tommy. Um, Alyssa, I think that's the first time here. Um, uh, well, remember. Alyssa Marie, welcome to the lifeboat. Yep. Mm -hmm. She lives in, uh, she said East Texas. That so was hot. I just wonder if it's humid there. <laughs> it's hot Ooh, down baby. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I spent uh, a decent amount of time in East Texas. At one time, I lived halfway between Galveston and Houston in a, uh, a little town called Clear Lake and uh, hot and humid in a very big way. But I love that part of the world. So uh, welcome as well to everybody new. And you know, people were getting, there's yeah. a lot of new people on the lifeboat, which is- American I Justice mean, that's stopped the dream, back in today too. So, what's that? American Justice. She caught the end of the show yesterday. Well, talked at the end of the show. She's back tonight too. Um, so welcome. Welcome back. Yep. Great to have you on board the lifeboat. And um, I think there was a couple. One more new one. I'm. I'm sorry, guys. I can't. <laughs> there's a lot to kind of keep up with. TNT. Um, yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you. I Boy, think. I think you might you have been TNT? here. TNT. Yeah. I think they've been here before. TNT. Boy. Yeah. Boy, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's all. Yeah, welcome to the lifeboat and, um, and to all. There's one more. Let me find it. I can't remember the account. I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying no, to keep up. I, you know, guy, I really am. I'm trying to remember because I try to put, you know, an avatar with the name so I can remember it. But it gets a little difficult sometimes. Um, but just know that we're, you know, if you need something in the background, contact us. We're here. Emails, yeah. emails are in the description. And obviously i think everybody in there is talking anyway so they're you know it's it's what it is guys your family when you walk through the door so boy you know what and uh i know that you hear that on every single uh youtube channel on the planet but we really uh we show we it. live up to that mm -hmm. i mean i'm sorry we really do i'm not crapping on all of the other youtube channels that say that yep there's really tommy tommy's crapping. back too tommy bird's back tonight um, I really am crapping on all those other channels. <laughs> you know what I mean? For real. I am. Well, it, it gets... I mean, I, 
it gets overused. There are a couple out there I can vouch for that actually do what. No, you know something, little, and we and we talk about them here on a regular exactly. basis. Exactly. <laughs> there is there is definitely a uh, a crew of people that are putting out um, a super positive message uh, that you know has that uh, that family kind of a feel to it. Yep. Um, obviously, Pyres comes to mind. Um, Mark Rip Fugle. readiness comes to mind. Yeah, Rip, Rip, Rip uh, Marfugel, you know, they report on, oh, you know, bad news sure, stuff, Marfugle. but they're all, yep, I mean, that's, that's all put out in a positive way. And I think, you know, even that falls into the communication. It really does. Like what we're talking about tonight. Absolutely. Yep. No, it, it absolutely does. It's, uh, the, uh, <laughs> People, I can't honestly. If we did this three times a week, right? If we if we took three days out of every week and just beat on the communication thing, we wouldn't be doing it enough. You know, we, we, obviously, you got to try to keep uh, material fresh so that people don't go, "God, does he talk about anything else?" But there is nothing in your um, in your sobriety in your walk, you know, that is going to be more important than communication. One of the reasons that you see that little video in the beginning, right? Where we come out and we say, we're not gonna talk about politics. We're not gonna talk about religion. Uh, we're not gonna allow mean people here. And we'd like to keep down on the cursing, right? All of that stuff is for a reason. And the reason is we want to foster the kind of a uh, environment where people feel comfortable coming in here and sharing things that you just probably wouldn't share on another YouTube channel. And in order to make that happen the way that it does, we uh, we got a lot of blue wrenches that are you know the best in the business that sort of keep this a um, as safe a place as we can, right? We're in we're in cyberspace and we're in you know social media, so yeah. But and so, and high to Grafted Branch Homestead. That was the one I was forgetting earlier. Um, good name, lord, say that again. Grafted Branch Homestead. But let me simplify it for you. His name is Matt. He said. Matt? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Matt, Matt, welcome to the lifeboat. That's good because you could have said that 25 times and I don't know that I would have remembered it. I got homestead out of it. Mm -hmm. Matt, welcome to the lifeboat. I'm, uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad that you're here. Now, in case anybody got here late, I'm going to say this again. I know that we pop in and we watch videos and sometimes we see them at, at weird times of the day. You know, everybody uh, sort of pops in and out. That's kind of the nature of a, uh, of a YouTube channel. Last night when uh, we finished up, Sundays are always a big night for us here on the lifeboat. A lot of people, um, a lot of people watch on Sundays. And when we were done, we were almost at the uh, 200 views while live, which is good for the lifeboat. So that's a great turnout. Um, but we're probably 150 or 160, something like that, more than that since then. The reason that I bring that up is it means that a lot of you pop back in and watch things at a later date or you watch it again stop in the comment section and read what people write. And if you see somebody that looks like they're in a bad place, number one, best case scenario, reach out to them and tell them that, you know, or her that you care. You know, sometimes that's really all that people need to hear. Then the second thing that you need to do is reach out to myself or my bobbleheaded partner. Our email addresses are everywhere, right? You're not gonna have a problem coming across uh, myself or, uh, or Mark, and we want to know. There's, there's really, as a, as a person sitting in this chair, there isn't a more hollow feeling than seeing a message that was left three hours earlier, and it was left by somebody that's in a really bad place. Yeah. That's just an awful feeling. And we are a family, people. So if you see something, speak up. You know, we want to do everything we can. And if you to, uh, to keep if, everybody here safe. And and if you guys well. do Bye, see, a, yeah, if you guys do see a comment like that, those of you guys that know how to get a hold of us, please try to reach out to us. And you know, if you've got our text number or whatever, if you see something like that, we may be able to reach these people that we may have already have their contact information and stuff that we might be able to reach out. Um, if you can't reach out to them directly. But leave a comment underneath theirs if you need to. Um, point it towards the Facebook group. There's usually somebody over there, which would not be me and Tommy because we don't go there. So you guys have a place to go without us. Um, and, you know, Charlie. Charlie Mullins does an awesome job throughout the stream. He will post our um, email addresses in the chat. He does it multiple times. And thank you, Charlie, for doing that. You know, we never asked him to do it. He just did it. And uh, he does. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. Yep. Awesome stuff. And Flaming Jackson says, if I was in a room with y'all, I would give 
y'all a great big hug. I love y'all. I just don't doubt that for <laughs> and not even one even, second. Even a hot second. There is just <laughs> nothing about that that I doubt. Jackson, we love you, bud. We really do. You're Chi- uh your top shelf. Chi Chi said she quit smoking. Stop it. That's what she said. Congratulations, Chi yeah, Chi. I mean, that's freaking awesome. That's I tell you what, guys, that gets overlooked. That is one of the hardest things you could ever do. I mean, and, and a <laughs> excellent point of illustration, yeah. right? I don't, uh, we don't get to say this as often as uh, as we should. Yeah, it is said very often that quitting cigarettes is as difficult as quitting heroin, and then very often heroin addicts will say, "Oh, come on, are you kidding me?" And I'll tell you why that is said because there is actually some logic to this. There, the delivery system right of putting nicotine into your lungs there is very few things on the planet that get into your system faster than that and for that reason um it becomes a coping mechanism for a lot of people i mean if, if you've ever seen you know like a, a car wreck or anything like that and you've got smokers on board within two seconds of being out of there every single one of them is lighting a cigarette i know i've told the story before but i was on an airplane sitting in a um an exit seat which I always book because my legs are long and I can kind of stretch out a little more. Well, the plane couldn't steer. The uh, the little deal in the back, which I think they call the aileron or something like that, was not allowing the plane to, uh, to steer. And for that reason, it was kind of dog running. You know what I mean? Like it was doing this number. So it's kind of coming in like this. And the uh, captain came over the loudspeaker and said, I don't think I can land this airplane. <laughs> which is uh, oh, a really God. fun conversation at uh, 35,000 feet. So they came over to talk to us, um, those of us in the exit rows in particular, and gave us the assignments that we were going to need to do uh, when the plane came to a rest, <laughs> depending on how that happened. And uh, they were doling out assignments. And the guy said to me, well, since you're the biggest guy in the aisle, um, your job once you get outside the plane is to ensure that no one lights up a cigarette because the wings are, you know, just a huge fuel tank. And, you know, when you, when a plane crashes, though that fuel goes everywhere, he said, and it's very, very dangerous stuff. He said, and I promise you, if there's a smoker on this plane, he is going to try to light a cigarette before the plane has come to a rest because of the stress. And it really is quite a bit of truth to that. You know, we become so accustomed to that little bit of nicotine just sort of um, mellowing us out that um, we get on it and we, uh, you know, we know that within half a second, you're feeling different. And that is the reason that they talk about the addictive properties of nicotine, especially when delivered through uh, through a cigarette. And people, it's the one thing I, I still can't quit, right? I think most yep. people know that it, um, I, well, I don't smoke cigarettes, but I vape. And uh, yeah, I cannot uh, seem to, to break that habit. I, you know, I didn't realize how big of an issue, you know, I grew up, my parents smoked and I never did, never have. Um, I just, for whatever reason, I didn't. I think a lot of it was because my parents smoked and you know, back in the eighties, you're sitting in the backseat of a car in the winter time, it's all cold outside. You're like, hey dad, you're smoking. Can you roll down the window a little bit? And he cracks it like a hair. And it's like, dude, what are you doing? You're killing me back here. (laughs) You know, just headaches all the time because of it as a kid. And I think it really turned me off of it. Um, So actually, it's kind of a reverse reverse thing because my parents smoked. I didn't. And I watched my parents, my mom especially, struggle to quit because she tried so many times. And she did for multiple years. And she recently just started smoking again after quitting for three years. So that right there tells me, and then when I went to in-house rehab, most of you guys know this, when I went there, it shocked me because everybody there is trying to kick a habit, like opiates or whatever it is, methamphetamine, alcohol, but they also take your cigarettes and give you a nicotine patch. And it's like, yeah. I'm like, oh my God, these people are going to flip. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if they're... What they did there, in my opinion, I think it's a mistake because what they do is they're adding another hurdle that you have to cross to get into the place. That's all right. it's going to go through a smoker's mind. I don't care what what else you're addicted to. 
Um, just saying. And these guys would put stuff in the ceiling tiles, like cigarettes, and put dryer, sure. dryer sheets on the air vents so they could smoke inside. And I mean, it was, yeah, it was like that. But um, I just, I don't personally know how hard that is because I don't, I mean, I can empathize, but I never smoked. It's something I never did. Um, but I do know what addiction feels like and how hard it can grab you. And I would have to say, just by hearing everybody talk, that it is right up there at the top. It and is it, a difficult, it is definitely a difficult thing I, to quit. I don't want to forget this too either. Chi Chi quit drinking also. So, God bless you, Chi Chi. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know how I missed that part. I guess I focused on the, so yeah, proud of you for sure. The seventh son is celebrating his seven months of sobriety today which wow. first of all is awesome it really is and i don't know it should almost be longer than that because if my memory serves me right i remember seven months ago and it wasn't a full-blown but anyway very impressive my friend we're proud as hell of you you know that's uh, that's big time it really is and it really will give you a uh, an idea of how long we've been doing this because tell me you don't remember that like it was yesterday you know, yeah. when uh, when Seventh decided that that was it. And, man, good for you. It's just great stuff, man. Awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, it's always the coolest thing in the world to, uh, like we always say, right? Yep. You own your past and then you celebrate your victories. And um, that's a big one, man. Yep. Seven months is a long, long time. It really is. So, well done, Seventh. I'm glad you guys share that with us, too, because, again, just like you don't have to share the negative, you don't have to share the positive either, because sometimes we forget that that sometimes is harder to share with people. It's almost an embarrassing thing for people to, to say things like that, because they probably know coming here if they say that, we're going to be like, good job, we're going to grab a hold of that, because that's what we want to see, right? No and, question. And if they're a little bit bashful or shy or whatever, they might not want to do that. So, thank you, and... That's just awesome for sharing that stuff. And hello, Brittany. And good to see you, Brittany. We're glad that you're here as well. Brittany has eyes. Speaking of, uh, of positive stuff, that's another that uh, another channel that you're never going to run into anything negative on. Yep. Pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. I, I love looking at the skies over there. Um, and this Christ boat Christine's is magic because it makes things happen. Chichi, what a nice thing to say. That, that is very awesome. Um, but yeah, I want to. I don't want to forget Christine Silverman either. She. Or, uh, not Silverman, but her last name is hard for me to remember. Um, you know what I'm talking about, right? I do. Christine Seidelman. Seidelman. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, Christine, if you're hearing this. I don't, I don't <laughs> think she's in here tonight, but I just wanted to tell everybody, please go check out her channel. She does some really cool photography on the beach, and she puts music with it. Um, very positive. She's she does probably some... better with a computer than anybody that I know. Yeah. I mean, honestly, she's better than I am. I no mean, question. I mean, no hard feelings. No, no question. No, no, I think I don't know. Me. I honestly don't know anybody that can do the things that she does. Yeah. Um, and yeah, her her first of all, her channel is cool. And even when she's here, like she's the only person I know who can write everything backwards or upside <laughs> down and backwards or you know different what I mean? Fonts. Yep. yep. Yeah, different fonts. She does uh, just some amazing stuff, and she is a uh, a powerhouse of a wrench. Hello, Maria. Uh, that was that was wrench, by the way. Yep. You caught that. Yes. I said wrench. <laughs> Just being careful. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks for, guys, I want to say this too. Um, I really appreciate you guys trusting me enough from Wages World to come over here and, and check this out. And um, it means the world to me. It really does. Um, you know, and there was a time that I would say that that's why my Wages World was still going um, because I had fallen into a funk with just doing the space weather thing. You know, so now I've kind of found a pretty decent balance for myself, and I'm able to do both. And I'm, I don't have any intentions of dropping Wages World, just so everybody understands that. But it, it really makes me feel good when you guys trust me enough to check out somebody that I recommend, which in this case actually is myself also. <laughs> right. And I'm not sure if you've seen that graphic there, Tommy, I put on the screen. I have. It, it's a communication thing that it's back yeah. part, it's part of the thumbnail. It goes from old to new. And I think that that actually is part of the conversation that we have, right? I yeah. Mean, because back in the day, man, if you wanted to communicate, even when we're talking about addiction, you had to go get in front of somebody's face. You don't have no. to do that. That's a positive thing that has changed. We don't have to do no that. No doubt. 
And but, before he he leaves the guy, hey, look, man, everybody has days. You know what I'm saying? And in recovery, a lot of us have a lot of those days. So if you're having one of them, bro, you don't owe an apology to anybody on the lifeboat, right? Save that for channels that judge you. If you're having a bad day, you're having a bad day. Our uh, our thoughts are with you, and we look forward to seeing you the next time you're on the boat. God bless and take care of yourself. Exactly. No apology necessary, man. We all have those days, man. Yep. We all have those 100%. days. One hundred percent. And I'm sorry, I kind of got off subject there. I kind of I think we both kind of squirreled a little bit, but for good reason. Um, Nonsense. I have never squirreled, <laughs> and uh, and I have no intention of starting now. But I, you know, I, and I just to kind of get us back a little bit is the fact that. You know what we're doing here is exactly what we what we're just talking about. We're communicating, and, and you know you can see how the communication if, if it start if it is a negative type of thing, you're not going to get to the positive end. You've got to some level, even if it doesn't go full blown. Hey man, you know great job, all this kind of stuff. If you keep a positive, you know, connotation to it, it will eventually. Even if you guys have to end your communications. Sometimes that's a healthy way to do things. Yep. I hate to say it like that, but it's just the God's no, honest truth. It's a truth. Um, you know, I had to do that w for a time with even my own parents. You know, me respecting my parents for a certain amount. Not now. I don't want to say that at all. It's not what I'm feeling. But me respecting my parents for a short amount of, amount of time there was me not going around and talking to them. Because I knew if I did, I was just going to explode and be nasty. And it wasn't... <laughs> Nothing positive is going to come from that. and Because, you know, I actually even had that conversation with my mother. It's like, listen, Mom, I know I haven't been coming around right now, but right now I don't, I can't. If I do, we're going to have issues. And I don't want to. So let me figure this out. And I promise I love you. It has nothing to do with that, that kind of thing. You know, and, and yeah, that time was allotted to me. And, you know, I found out through my thought process, I was wrong in some areas, and so was they. So if I'd have walked into it at the beginning, I wouldn't have said I was wrong on anything. So that's that's kind of what I'm saying. And Cemetery said, um, if you look like a troll, is that, uh, you know, does that make you a troll? And uh, I'm gonna go with no on this one because one of the two hosts of the uh, lifeboat most assuredly looks like a troll. And there are no trolls hosting the lifeboat. No, right. I'll let you work out. I'll let you work out who's <laughs> who's who on that. Well, yeah. No, but uh, absolutely not. Um, I'm uglier than a wet paper bag. Well, you know something. The uh, the beautiful thing is, and I'm so glad Chi Chi is here for this. Right? This is this is uh, this harkens back to the uh, the Chi Chi days. But uh, we did a video once, and uh, it was spending a good deal of time talking about the difference between attractive and beautiful. And, uh, you know, there is a huge difference, people. There really is. Um, beautiful uh, is a decision that is made, you know, sometimes hundreds of times a day. You know, we choose to be beautiful. Um, attractive is, uh, you know, something in the genetic lottery where if, you know, dad was the right height and weight and looked the right way and mom was the, uh, the you know, and those two things come together and, um, you know, someone can be very, very attractive and hideously ugly. Seriously, oh I know some of the, some of the most attractive people I've ever met are some of the ugliest human beings I've ever come across. And people who did not win the genetic lottery are some of the most beautiful people that I have ever met. And we, uh, for a long time here on the lifeboat, we had a uh, battle cry that was be beautiful. You know what I mean? Like make that choice. Um, and I don't know that I've touched on that since right around the time that yeah. um chi chi had to uh to leave for internet reasons so she probably thinks that this is all i talk about but uh <laughs> you've ne <laughs> you've never said anything so true though i mean no there's there it, really is a lot of truth to there that. there is so much truth to that and and I, and I think again i have to say coming here and hearing it like you just said it is something you're not going to get in most places you will in a few but the fact that we're saying that is should let you know exactly what everybody in this chat is showing um well and we have and we have hands down the most beautiful audience um on uh, all of youtube and the, the amazing thing about that is i couldn't tell you what 
80 to 90 percent of the audience looks like but we're talking about some of the most beautiful people on this planet and there's no no joke exactly hey joanna good to see you ain't seen you in a minute good to see you but yeah um so much is you know with that whole beauty and and you know the physical versus what's going on and inside I can't tell you how many times, if you're a kid, right? If you're in your adolescence, what are you actually looking for? Your hormones are raging. You ain't looking for beautiful. You're looking for attractive. Let's just be real. I mean, that's what that is. And at some time, and usually in our late teens, in the early 20s, our mind starts to think, you know, change. And then as you get married and you do certain things like that, and I say this because this applies to our addictions, guys. I mean, all this is part of it. And even in a relationship with, that you have with, with your wife or your husband for a very, very long time, at the beginning, a lot of it is focused on the sex part. And you'll see that grow into something so much better that even when the sex isn't there all the time, it's still a better relationship. And it's, it's once you get, and, and again, guys, I mean, it, and it has to do with a lot of, actually, believe it or not, a lot of chemistry in your body and all that kind of thing. There's a lot of biological stuff there we could get, touch on. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, the beauty is what you find, you know, and, and sometimes you don't know that beauty. Like, I, you know, I even, I told my wife today she was my hero. And that's, that's the God's honest truth. I love that. I mean, she really, she really is. And I love that. Because I was just sitting here thinking. Yeah. Like, I was sitting here thinking, I was, matter of fact, I think, I can't remember, it was right before I was going to go take a nap or whatever, but um, I was watching something, and it's kind of, you know, stuck out of my brain a little bit, and I was like, you know what, why am I keeping that to myself? <laughs> so I picked my phone up and texted her, you know? Um, would I have said that to her face-to-face? -face? Yeah, nowadays I would, but early on, there was an embarrassment there that I wouldn't have, even being married to her for 20 years. But after we've been through the recovery part and the addiction and all, and we're still in the recovery, never will not. Go ahead. Okay, I got two comments that I have got to address. Number one, there was a great one from Lewis Clark that said, today was the first day I sat my family down and told them how sorry I am for all I have put them through. Never apologized for the 15 years I was using. I feel like the world has been lifted off of my shoulders. What a beautiful, oh beautiful God. thing, huh? You're on the um, right road, man. You know, Good and influence. I'll tell you something, if you, if there's a hangover from it, because sometimes that happens, where you feel really good and then afterwards the guilt starts crawling or whatever, please reach out to somebody. The second comment, it's so rare that I disagree with anybody on the light boat, but I'm going to. Um, Roxana Mathis says, nobody is ugly. We may see ourselves as ugly, but that does not define us. It's an illusion to keep you down. You are worthy always. I'll tell you something. This is the, the only, I'll tell you how I disagree. Just. A little bit i mean you you see people sometimes that forget what they look like forget their appearance i mean you see people who are just so overwhelmed with hate that i don't care how i mean that, truthfully there are people that just exude ugly racism right hatred things like that no matter how much that gets churched up or how much that you know that's yeah. dressed up or whatever yeah there are uh, certainly there is as far as the physical goes you're right i agree with you but there are people that choose ugly just like you can choose beautiful mm -hmm. and choose to be a beautiful person unfortunately there are people that go the other route there are definitely people out there who choose um hate as their default setting and if you choose love as your default setting then yeah there is no ugly there really isn't it, yeah. but if you choose hate as your default setting Man, you can work for Victoria's Secret. And you're still gonna be ugly. It's, it's just it's, the way it is. Yeah, I agree. And I and I think that you know, I think kind of what she and what how I would say that too. I agree 100 with what you said, and how I would look at that would be kind of like um, I don't know. Maybe you went to a costume store and you're looking at two different costumes to look at. One of them was a hate costume. One of them was a love costume. You chose the hate. Right. It doesn't mean doesn't mean that you can't change your costume. Damn straight. I've so seen it. I have, I have lived it, people. Yeah. I mean, you absolutely can change who you are. The beautiful thing about, um, and, and one of the fastest ways to do that, truthfully, 
is to just um, remove the poison that you're putting into your body every single day. I have watched transformations happen in people's lives when they remove the poison that they uh, voluntarily have been poisoning themselves with for, in some cases, decades, you know? And then it's like, uh, it's the whole, you know, chrysalis thing, right? Once that hate starts flecking away, you know, the the, yes. uh, the butterfly emerges and you see really, really beautiful things. And not, not only do we put, you know, bad drugs in our bodies, um, you know, you could put bad drugs in your in, in your mind by just watching the wrong things. Um, it really, it can change your mood. How many times you guys sat down and watched a movie, you were in an okay mood, and then you walked away from it feeling like, man, I want to go punch somebody. Or, you, you know what I mean? Does anybody else feel, feel that? Or, or maybe even the reverse. So, I mean, I think we can put poison that way too, and it definitely can be a, an addiction. 100. But yeah, you guys are awesome. <laughs> oh man yeah Jeff I would agree with that people that are miserable on, on the inside will project that onto others 100% there is no doubt there is absolutely no doubt and and we, you know, we've all experienced that too you know you ever been in, in, in a you know you're at a, a party or you're at a gathering or whatever and you know there's six people hanging out and just having a beautiful time and everything is happy and and all it takes is one person who's miserable to come walking into that circle spewing hatred or anything else and you can just watch it's like letting the air out of the room you know where you, where all of a sudden you know everything that was good just doesn't feel it that way anymore 100. i'm gonna put some pancakes in my body <laughs> Don't go wrong. please tell me you're using real vermont maple syrup <laughs> that uh you know that, <laughs> flavored stuff in a can yeah. <laughs> that's where tommy's from right ain't that where that's you're from? right I, I i truthfully i think if you cut me i actually bleed maple syrup it's uh one of those things that the uh, the state that i'm from has uh no industry whatsoever so outside of um skiing we had maple, maple syrup. syrup or as they call it back there sugaring yeah. is what the uh the term is back there for sure it's like buying it's like buying a sparkling wine versus champagne um you can't call it champagne unless it's made in champagne <laughs> right unless it's, it's from grown that part of or the world, grown yeah. yeah unless it's grown i guess yeah you're but cemetery jesse, says yes yum good sounds like he's using the good stuff yep jesse made a good one there yeah, too. jesse you know what jesse there is no question i i literally could not you know what? Somebody remove Jeffrey Canale, please. He he needs axed. Yeah, get him out of here. <laughs> At least a three hundred second timeout. Come on, let's that, go. I mean, you're, <laughs> he's lucky he doesn't get a six year timeout. Yeah, that's all right. We'll ship you to Canada. You can drink all that you want. Hey, we got a lot of Canucks here, guys. Uh, uh, Chris, Kiss Freak. Um, that's true. Yep. And... Yeah, but he but he eats uh, Vegemite. I mean, how much are you going to take yeah, his uh, yeah, palate yeah. into? Uh, <laughs> I saw him shoot a video and say that he enjoyed Vegemite, which yeah. means any anything having to do with his taste buds are now in a serious question for all eternity. <laughs> love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. I tell you what, guys, this has been a really great show. Um, you know, see, we take a we take a really hard topic and we really get to what we need to, and there's a lot of good stuff that happened in the comment section, and then we had some fun on the end. Um, yep, Roxanne, you're absolutely right. I'm sorry. I think individuals are put together for a reason to support and lift up. No question. 100. Absolutely no question. I, I I could not agree with that. And somebody removed Fiona too while you're at it. I could not agree with that anymore. Um, really, absolutely. Uh, I don't think there are coincidences and I don't think there are accidents. And the, uh, the crew of the lifeboat um, most assuredly has come together and I have seen magic happen with this crew i have seen it uh, transform lives you people have done some of the most amazing things ever since uh since coming together it's been so much more than we ever could have hoped for and that's the truth that is the truth um and hope hope you watch the replay middle gray sorry you got here late and see miss v says blah i assume she's talking about maple syrup from canada okay everybody this we will be back 23 hours from right now. Same bad time, same bad channel. We're going to be doing very similar stuff because this is what we do.
people, communication is the backbone to everything we do. If you start feeling squirrely, right? Talk to somebody. If you start feeling out of sorts, reach out. If you allow that stuff to take hold, nothing good comes of it. It, you never are better off not sharing. There's never ever been a, a, a time when holding something in benefited anybody. So if you start feeling like things aren't going well, please reach out to somebody, please, right? It's the right thing to do. Between now and 23 hours from now, when we gather back here on the lifeboat, you have but one assignment, reach out and try to save somebody, please. I am Captain Tommy Scoville and on the other side of the glass, Mark Wages and I hid her chair. So squirrel is back in the basket. This is a cat in the basket. Hey, good night, everybody. We love you.